Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore our relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Episode 4, Natural Magic with John Michael Greer. John Michael Greer is a widely respected author and blogger in the fields of nature spirituality, and the future of industrial society. He is the author of more than 50 books and his blog, Ecosophia. He lives in Rhode Island with his wife, Sarah. In this episode, we're going to talk with John about some things that anybody can do to try their hand at natural magic and why you would want to do that. I hope you enjoy the episode. I surely did. Hello, everybody, and we'd like to welcome John Michael Greer today to the Plant Cunning Podcast. And uh, he's an occultist, a former arc druid, novelist, peak oil writer, and blogger. Yeah, welcome, John Michael Greer. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. Yeah. So, John, um, what brought you to magic and uh, to nature spirituality? Okay. Um, Well, I grew up in the South Seattle suburbs in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Well, of course, you know, through through that that whole both those decades to some extent. And one thing you cannot say about growing up in in mid 20th century century suburban America is that it was interesting. Mm -hmm. It was it was stunningly dull. Um, everything around me was, and, and everybody, you know, all the, my parents, my teachers, ever, the media, all insisted the world was this plastic, one-dimensional, smiley thing that, you know, where you would um, lurch through a, a, an utterly predictable life where nothing existed except what, um, well, of course, Carl Sagan wasn't, was, was not even known yet, but nothing existed except what the scientists claimed did. It was all very understood stood and very predictable. We'd all get cheap, abundant electricity from nuclear power forever and all that crap. Yeah. Um, I was bored out of my wits. I mean, by the age of six, I was going, there's got to be more to life than this. <laughs> and so as I was, I was a, um, a voracious reader and rather a geek. They didn't have the term Asperger's syndrome in those days, but I, that's, that was me. That is me. And so, um, so I plunged into reading. I went looking for anything that was less tacky, less plastic, less one-dimensionally monotonous mm-hmm. than the suburban world and that, that I was told was, was all that existed. And of course, I found plenty. Um, the, by, the, by the late 1960s, the paperback nonfiction revolution was underway. You had uh, every grocery store, every drugstore had a rack of paperbacks with, with and there were, some, there were always some titles about, you know, um, beyond belief, stranger than science. All, uh, originally, you, you had people like Frank Edwards who would just put together these vast compilations of spooky stories and things that happened or did they. Or I loved them. The Bermuda Triangle, I loved that. Um, Eric von Duniken came out with chariots of the gods claiming that we'd been visited by space aliens in the distant past. I, I ate that up. I was a, I, I was a specialist and an expert in wolf, werewolf trivia by the age of 11. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't matter all of anything like that was interesting, but as I proceeded through this this giddy quest for a more for, for a less dull world, um, I kept on running across references to magic, not just as uh, you know a, 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 a plot a plot engine in, in the bad fantasy novels that I also devoured in those days, um, not just as you know something woo 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 off in the distance or in mythology, but something people were actually doing here and now. And I was going, whoa, this sounds cool. And so I went looking. <clears throat> and there, back in those days, there wasn't, you didn't have the kind of, the, the kind of immense resources in print that, that we're used to nowadays. But there were a few books. I got them. Um, and let's see, it would have been the winter of 1976-1977. There was a book freshly published called Techniques of High Magic by Francis King and Stephen Skinner. I got it. I snapped that puppy up. That became my Bible for a while. And, until I'd done everything in it. But that was really the turning point. That was the point at which I decided that, that here is this thing called magic. I can do it. It's, it's this reality, this marvelous door into a less boring world, as indeed it proved out to be. And so that was, and to some extent, all she wrote. And so from, from teenage to middle age, um, 
it's been a long, strange road. Nature spirituality was a little more complex because the magic that was available, the, the serious magical training that was available in those days in books was all pretty much based on the, the teachings of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is very, very high ceremonial magic. Um, that, it was what I could get. Um, I personally have always found um, you know, experiences in nature to be very profound spiritual experiences, but I kind of had to sort of put that on hold while I was pursuing the magical work. Then I ended up um, in a magical lodge with an older guy who was also involved in, in one of the one of the Druid orders, the Order of Bards of Eighth and Druids. We talked about it, I ended up joining. And that was all she wrote. And so from that that was in nineteen ninety four. Yeah. And from that time on, I was, you know, trying to find this this point of integration between um my druid nature spirituality on the one hand and my my magical practice on the other and, and a lot of my books of course have ended up sketching out one or another aspect of the, of the bridge between those so how do you describe the difference between ceremonial magic and natural magic okay that's, that's a great question um i'm and i'm gonna have to to explain it i'm gonna have to get into a little bit of a cult philosophy okay. because the basic the, the basic idea underlying um, underlying occultism is that the, the world that we experience with our senses, the material plane, we can call it, is only one level of existence and there are many others. And they are, I mean, they're not actually like physically above each other, but we can think of them as metaphorically rising from the material plane at the, at the bottom of the stack, up level by level to the spiritual plane at the top of the stack. And everything that exists in the material world is created by cascades of energies coming down the plates. So if you want to do something magically, you've got basically two obvious choices. You can take things in the material world that are full of these particular currents of energy that are descending, that have some particular charge, and you can use those as kind of batteries of energy. Or you can figure out how to interact with the currents of, the, of energy as they descend on a non-physical manner using um, you know, things like um, will and concentration and words of power and things like that. So working with the energies when they're already in material form, that's natural magic. Mm -hmm. Working with the energies in as they descend, that's ceremonial magic. You don't have to choose one or the other. Most, most magicians throughout history have, have always done both. Mm, right. But there is the difference, of course. So, and I guess we skipped over what is magic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Um, the definition that I like to use is the one that Dion Fortune proposed, um, I think back in the 1920s. Um, she argued that magic is the art and science of causing change in consciousness in accordance with will. Now, most people, when they hear that, immediately jump to the wrong conclusion. And the wrong conclusion is, oh, you mean it just causes change in, in the magician's consciousness. That's not what it says. Conduit causing change in consciousness. My consciousness, your consciousness, consciousness of other people, um, consciousness of beings that don't happen to have bodies, because that's also part of the magical universe. Uh, if it affects consciousness, it can be used as a tool of magic. Yeah, that's, that's much more powerful than, than the first, first look at it. Exactly, exactly. Well, we, we have this dogma in modern, in modern society, this dogma that consciousness can only be this weird sort of function of these lumps of meat called human brains. And matter is the thing that's real. And again, from the point of view of, the, of a cult philosophy, that's simply nonsense. Magic is, some, or magic, when I say matter, is simply the densest form of what's real. Ver all these other planes also exist. They all interpenetrate. They're all present here and now. And if you learn how to, how to work with them, you can cause some pretty remarkable changes in consciousness, yours and those of others. So what are some of those ways that you can work with natural magic? Like what are some practical applications, things that you can- Okay, um, the, the, one of the great examples here, because every, every, we, everybody worries about money and, and most people worry about love, okay? <laughs> so we can talk about both of those as great examples. Um, <clears throat> nearly always, when people have money trouble, if you actually sit them down and get them talking, a lot of what's going on has to do with their own attitudes, with how they're, how they're relating to money, how they're relating to work, how they're relating to the idea of having wealth. And if you can change your attitude toward these things, you can very often change your economic status um, rather dramatically. Um, 
And the, reason, the, the, the core thing here is that most people get caught up in wanting two different things at once. Okay? They want to have money, but they also want to spend money. You can't do both of those. So one of, the big, one of the core secrets of magic and one of the things you get taught first in any sensible occult school is that you, get, you attain power by willing one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. And that in itself, over and above, you set aside the ceremonial stuff, set aside the, you know, the, um, the, the amulets and so on. If you can simply learn to will one thing at a time, you can accomplish an enormous amount. I mean, if you say you want a million dollars, this is nothing could be easier. All you have to do is look at every interaction you're in. Will this help me make my million? Mm. Look at every dollar you spend and say, do I really want to spend that or should I put that, work, what, that to work making my million? And so on and so forth. You get a million dollars sooner than you think. You just can't do that and spend the million dollars at the same time, of course. Now, that's, that's just the unaided action of will, and that's enormously powerful. But if you want to add to it with magical means, and we want to talk about natural magic here, there are various substances, various particular herbs and stones, that resonate with certain kinds of will, with certain kinds of energy that are good at concentrating your attention and helping you to strengthen that act of will with energy that's not, not part of you, that's part of that pattern of descending forces. And so, if you, you know, one of the things that my book, The Natural Magic Encyclopedia, is about is exactly the long list of, um, you know, what, you, what, what can you do with this? And so, oh, let's say you want to do um, something, you want to do something involving money. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> prosperity so you want to get um certain things that are typically that are traditionally associated with prosperity and success um one example is jade mm-hmm. very simple stone another is vervain verbena officinalis okay mm-hmm. and um the ash tree is another one wood wood leaves or anything for an ash tree garlic is also good for that um there are, there are a range of things, and you can, you, you can look through traditional lists of, you know, stuff you put in an amulet, and you get, a, you know, the, say, a, an African-American hoodoo recipe for a, a success amulet. Look at what's in it. All those things are going to have been chosen because they have that resonance. They click in to that action of will. And so when you, let's say, okay, let's say you, 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 want, you, want to help, you want to help build that will toward making your million, you choose some, some herbs, some stones, from the traditional lists, you make them into an amulet, typically a little bag. Um, and you make it, in this country, you make it green to represent money. <laughs> and you, and, you, and you, you tuck it in your pocket. Or you make it kind of flat and you stick it in your wallet. And you carry it with you. And partly the psychological effect, you know, you, you're actually expressing your will to get that million dollars in the, form of, in the form of making this amulet, but also that amulet, because it has that resonance with energy, that resonance with your will, helps, pu- helps push you gently in that direction. So you'll be walking along and say, oh my, that's an investment opportunity I did not think about. I, I, have, I, have, I wonder what I can do with that. Or, you know, oh, hmm, they're, oh, they're, they're offering some kind of sales position and there's, you know, da 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 well, should I look into that? All of a sudden you're more oriented toward money and, you know, you make your money. Um, so that, that's, that's one example. Before I go on, I should probably ask if you have questions. Well, um, I mean, that's, that's, I, I'd like to, you to go on. We have some more questions for after. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, the, the, other, the other great example that I like to use here is love. Again, most people worry about love, they, especially, you know, those, the many of us who are not in, full, in long-term relationships. We, you know, we fret about that, understandably. That's one of the places, of course, occultists have been casting love spells for, since, since, the, since there have been human beings. I suspect our Australopithecine ancestors cast love spells. <laughs> um, but here again... If you're having trouble finding a relationship, there's usually a, there's, there are usually attitude issues. There are things going on in yourself. You are approaching the wrong people. You are um, attracted to people who are going to ditch you. Um, there's all these things that are going on, these tangled kinds of, of complexities. And so um, here again, you find... Um, you, you, you try to, well, actually, in many cases, this is a great example, because in many cases, it's very hard for you to understand what's getting in your way. That often takes a lot of psychology. Um, 
but you can work with it anyway. So you get the herbs and the stones and things that correspond to your intention of love. You create an amulet. You, you do some other things that magical, like for example, um, you burn a, a green candle on um, the hour of Venus every Friday. Green is the color of Venus. You're invoking that energy of love into yourself. And the goal here is to become more lovable. That's the, that's the ultimate, magic, the ultimate magic spell. If you, want, if you want people to love you, you make yourself more lovable. Mm. And so you do these things all to sort of reorient your mind, reorient your will and your energies toward the thing that you desire. And that's the basis of natural magic, doing that with things that are in the world that you can, all, you can use. Um, they're, they're already there. They have the energy. So you can use that energy. That's, those are really good examples. Um, and so this, of course, brings the issue of ethics uh -huh. to the picture. And that's something that you stress very highly. I, I know you've said mm -hmm. in the past that ethics are as important to magic as hygiene or uh, sanitization is to medicine. Exactly. And in, in either case, if you leave them out, things go septic really fast. Mm -hmm. And these are two really good examples because wealth spells and love spells, if you do them wrong, they will blow up in your face. And I've watched this more times than I can think of. Okay, if you want to do a, a love spell, do a love spell concentrating on making yourself more lovable. Do not do a love spell saying, I want that person to fall in love with me. That's not a love spell. You're trying to control someone else's mind. Yeah. Not a good idea. This is where one of the basic principles of magic comes into play. And this is the thing I call the raspberry jam principle. Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried spreading raspberry jam onto anything else, you know you're going to get it on your own fingers. <laughs> okay? Magical energy is exactly the same way. If you are putting together this whammy to try to control that, that cute chick over there, what you're doing is taking, um, slathering yourself with energies of being controlled. Mm -hmm. And it will be easier for other people to manipulate you. I love this analogy. <laughs> the, the, the classic love spell gone wrong story. I have yet to meet an occultist who's been in the game for more than about five years who does not have at least one of these. The person who, you, you fall in love with this person. You want this person in your life. You decide that, you know, magic is going to do this. You do this big spell. And what happens, okay, you don't know this. What happens is that as you do the spell, um, the, the other person for about 15 minutes feels unaccountably warm and soft and fuzzy toward you. And then goes, what am I thinking? And then reacts in the other direction and decides that she can't stand you. Meanwhile, the energies of the spell rebound on you, so you end up hopelessly besotted, giddy in love with a person who literally cannot stand the sight of your face. <laughs> I've seen it, it is, it's mechanically exact. I've seen it over and over again. Do not go there. Your friends will find it very amusing, but I promise you, you will not. <laughs> so, so here again, what you want to do Concentrate your magic on yourself, make yourself more lovable, and people will fall in love with you. Mm. You know, and then some person who perhaps you haven't even noticed will, you know, will, will, will you know, show some interest and you can go out for coffee and then things take their course. Because if you make yourself lovable, people will love you. That does not mean making yourself fit some culturally approved stereotype of being lovable. That's the problem that a lot of guys have these days. They've, they've been handed this stereotype of the nice guy. And they've been told, follow this stereotype of the nice guy and women will, women will love you. And of course, they won't. Because the stereotype of the nice guy is the stereotype of somebody who is taken advantage of, of course. And so uh, most, of the, most of the ladies spend their time chasing after bad boys anyway and leave the nice guys in the dirt. Um, <laughs> that's, ignore your cultural stereotypes. Work with the energies directly using, again, herbs, stones, candles, oils, all the various things of natural magic. And, you know, you'll be fine. Okay, money is another great example when it comes to ethics, and this also has, there are two classic m mistakes when it comes to money magic. Mm -hmm. The first one is the one where you are insufficiently careful in what you specify. New Agers used to get into this problem all the time. You know, they do creative visualization. They'd imagine themselves among heaps of money, and then they'd get a job at minimum wage counting bills or something, <laughs> you know, or, or working or working in one of these stories where one of these stores where they serve, where they sell Chinese hell money in denominations, of $10 million bills. <laughs> it, it it's funny, but it happens. Yeah. But that's, 
That's the funny one. The less funny one is what you do, what happens when you do a spell to get money without earning it. Mm. Everybody likes to do that. They think, I'm, I'm going to do a spell to win the lottery. I'm going to do a spell to, to get lots of money that I haven't done anything yet. That will blow up in your face so badly it is not funny. Because what you're asking is that you, somebody else earns money and you get it. Mm. Somebody else produces value. And you get the value they don't. So you're trying to make the world less economically fair. Mm. Everybody I know who has done a spell like this has ended up having a sudden financial loss. Yeah. Like their house is cleaned out by burglars. Or, you know, the, the, someplace where they have money invested goes bankrupt. There's been embezzlement. Their money is gone. Mm. Again, I've seen it over and over again. If you want to do a prosperity spell, the, pros the thing that works is... I want opportunities to earn money. I want opportunities to work hard and earn lots of money. And if you, it, with that approach, if you say, I want to earn it, find me a way to do it, that's, that's very safe. Yeah. I've watched people do that over and over again and end up with embarrassingly large amounts of money. <laughs> I mean, bluntly, it's worked for me. So, <laughs> Well, that's good. So yeah. We have love... We have money. Uh, mm -hmm. Another big uh, topic and issue is protection. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that like, there seems to be always some sort of drama going around these days. And like people who are talking crap about somebody else behind their back or all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. And I know that in, in the magical community and the, even in, like the alternative communities, there's a lot of people who are really into like cursing and hexing. Oh yes, Na the, yes, the fine art of nasty magic. Right. Um, well, you would suggest yeah. somebody would like make themselves impervious to mm -hmm. attack. Or yeah, what are some other ways that that someone can? Okay. Yeah, no, that that's that's very straightforward. And because the thing is, there is a lot of ugly energy running around. Yeah. Um, you have the, the, the people who are practicing nasty magic and, and flinging, you know, flinging whammies at anybody they want. You have people who are simply nasty human beings who, vi who, who radiate misery and, and hatred. Yeah. Um, a lot of them in politics these days. Um, you, have, you also just have the fact that life in a modern, a modern community these days, because Americans have no notion of magical hygiene. We're in the position of, of people in the Middle Ages who are literally, you know, crapping in chamber pots and throwing the slop out the window onto the street. That's how we, that, that's our, that's our level of, of magical and, and, and spiritual cleanliness these days. We're filthy and our environments are filthy. So the protections against that, very important. Um, the first thing to, the, the first line of defense here is cold running water. Yeah. And that people go, Ugh because the thought of cold showers. Nonetheless, what, what, I've talked earlier about these, these various levels of, of, of reality above the material level. Um, the one immediately above the material level is called by, by occultists the etheric level. This is the level of life force. And it is so close to physical that it behaves like physical substance in some ways. And so one of the ways you can exploit that is that cold water will absorb etheric substance and wash it away. So, you know, you've been, you've had somebody thinking nasty thoughts, thoughts at you, or you've simply been out in a grubby etheric environment or, you know, any of the other things that might happen. Okay. Cold water. It will literally strip the crud right off your energy body. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of occultists, you, because, you know, not so many people are into cold showers. It's still a little bit of shock to the system. A lot of occultists use the, use basically a washcloth bath. Um, you know, once a day, you, you take a washcloth, you wring it out in cold water, and you rub down your whole body with it, mm. um, rinsing it out regularly. The level of crud that will come off, it's sometimes visible crud, um, even if you are spotlessly clean and haven't been you know, out in the dust or anything, is really quite remarkable. Mm. Um, that's always, that, that's a, a good basic thing to do. Always get the bottom of your feet. In North America, a lot of people know how to do foot magic uh, nastiness is where they're putting something on the ground. You step in it, it affects you. Mm -hmm. um, always wash the bottoms of your feet with cold water. Uh, it, it will help. Okay. There are plenty of other things that offer, that offer protective um, influence. For example, you make an amulet. Um, St. John's wort. 
Okay, it has a lot. It's it's a medicinal plant. It's mostly famous now for its use in treating depression, but it's also actually a very anti, very strong antibacterial and antiviral. It has just a range of other positive effects, but it's also one of the most powerful protective herbs there is. Um, it the the actual the, the Latin name for the genus Hypericum comes from Greek hypericon above um, phantasms. It is that which rules over phantasms and, and images and ghosts and things. Um, so yeah, um, you can you, you get some you get some Saint John's Wort, especially the flower, very strong. Um, you put that in a in a red cloth bag and carry it with you. You will have a lot less trouble. Mm. With uh, how did the old poem go? Ghoulies and geisties and lang leggety beasties and things that go about in the night. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's I mean that, that's 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 a common one. That's that's one of those standard things that a lot of people used back in the day, and that a growing number of people, as they become aware of the kind of nonsense that that goes on these days, are starting to use again. Um. The, again, there are lots of other herbs that do the same thing. Lots of resins, lots of oils. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I think there may be more protective herbs than just about anything else, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Yeah, that is a good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, would you suggest that people do banishing rituals, or is that maybe something that people who want to specifically focus on occultism would do? Like, that's okay, that's ceremonial magic. Okay. A banishing, anytime you, you have the word ritual or ceremony, you're talking ceremonial magic. Now, for those of our listeners who don't know what a banishing ritual is, it's a ritual that banishes. I, I know that's kind of, <laughs> but basically it's a pattern of movements and words and visualizations, things that you imagine and in, in directions of your will that bring the area you're in and bring yourself into balance with the with the magical forces as they, as they descend into the cosmos one of the effects of this is if there are creepy energies around or creepy beings around they hightail it they leave they cannot abide being in, in a space that's been that's been banished and they can't abide it when you are doing the banishing there are a lot of different good banishing rituals um and one that one that i teach a lot um on my on my dream with account for example is to call the sphere of protection um there's another very famous one called the lesser banishing ritual the pentagram now I encourage anybody who's going to be doing magic seriously, who's going to be taking that up as a regular practice, to take up a daily banishing ritual just the, the same way you do a daily shower to stay clean, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. If you're just doing a little natural magic here and there to improve your life, maybe not so much. Because, you know, once you're, once you're actually doing serious, once you're doing a serious ceremony and a banishing ritual is a serious ceremony, once you're doing that regularly, you're in the magical world. You are on the path, as we like to say, and things are going to get complex. It's not for everybody. Magic is not for everybody. Natural magic is, pretty, is for pretty close to everybody. Most people in, in traditional societies use natural magic as a, as a matter of course. It's just one of those things you do. But the actual practice of, of ceremonies, that tends to be a specialist activity. That's something that you want some training. Um, at least you want to do a lot of hard work so that you know what you're doing, and a lot of hard study, of course, so that you know what you're doing, you can actually direct the energy skillfully. Right, okay. So, so where did you learn um, about ceremonial magic? Like, how did... In, in, your, in my case? Mm -hmm. um, well, again, here, there I was, you know, 15-year-old geek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no social skills. Um, <laughs> Typical Asperger's syndrome and a voracious a uh, appetite for reading. I learned it from books. Okay. Now, one of the things that has actually been very typical of Western magic for many centuries is that it can be learned from books. Um, the the idea the idea that you get the book and you open it and there are the you know on the on the pages of these mysterious eldritch signs and symbols and it's actually closer to reality than you think. Because, I mean, for so long during the centuries when magic was persecuted by religious authorities, you couldn't have, you know, hang out a shingle as a school of magic. You'd have those guys from the Inquisition come, you know, trotting over to invite you to one of their barbecues. Not a good plan. But you could have books. You could, you know, if somebody approaches you, they, they, they figured out that you're an occultist. They want to learn. You've put them through the ringer to and various tests to make sure they're legitimate. And then you hand them the book and you say, okay study this. Make a copy by hand that you can pass on to someone else. 
Mm. Um, and but here it gives the instructions and so that a lot of what we have in the way of western magic is the stuff that survived because it could be written down because you could communicate it by you know here is this book follow these instructions do these rituals daily um do these other practices see what happens and so because of that it was possible for me and for of course a great many other people to get certain books um, like the book Techniques of High Magic that I mentioned, which was packed with the basic rituals of the Golden Dawn tradition, and pile into them and go, wow, this stuff works. Mm. And then it's a matter of, you know, was going from book to book, eventually, find, in my case, um, Israel Bogarty's book, The Golden Dawn, which is pretty much the complete records of one of the great ceremonial magic orders of the late 19th century. Um, all of their rituals, all of their meditations, all of their practices, and so on. And that was my textbook from for about 15 years of hard work. Yeah. Um, I did eventually end up being initiated into several different magical orders, and you're going through the ceremonial initiations and all this kind of stuff. I've done, I've done that too, but self initiation works. Mm. And you know, so the, one of the reasons that I ended up getting into occult, occult writing and, and publishing books on the subject is because you know. I knew from my own experience that you could do this, so I'm going to write other books that will help other people do the same thing. Mm, yeah. So back in uh, the like England and, and uh, early America, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the healers and herbalists were also uh, magicians. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm interested in your perspective on like you know what is an occultist, what is a healer, what is a mystic, what what where do you see <laughs> the different uh, you know the different tracks. Okay. Well, we, we, have, we, we should always start with questions like this, remembering that all of these things are words. Yeah. <laughs> Healer, occultist, magician, mage, um, mystic, what have you. These, these are sounds we're making with our mouths that we use to label various lumps of human behavior. And so an exact definition is rarely possible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I forget who it was who pointed out that all definitions ultimately come down to pointing at something going, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> which, which from, it's a good way to remember that we are not as far from our primate ancestors as we'd like to think. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what is a healer? A healer is anybody who heals. Mm -hmm. um, if, if it's somebody who, who uses, um, lots of plants let's say we can then talk about an herbal healer but one of the things you'll notice if you actually if you if you read materials from say colonial america or early modern late renaissance britain and so on is that very few people specialized so you you know let's say let's say you know you're you, you are comfortably ensconced in a little village in in colonial rhode island and you go to the local wise woman because you have some kind of health problem. So she's going to find out what the health problem is. She's going to uh, you know, ask you questions and she's going to brew up some, some herbal stuff that you can take. And she's going to give you a charm, some kind of like an amulet that will protect you. And her bedside manner, you know, the way that she kind of talks you through it and makes you feel relaxed and comfortable and safe, that's going to have an effect too. Mm -hmm. And if she knows how to do anything else, if she has, you know, some patent medicines that have been brought by ship from Britain or what have you, it, she uses the whole range of things yeah. because it's not about being in one particular style. It's a matter of, well, here are the tools I have. How can I help this person so that, um, A, the person will be helped, and B, I will get paid so I have, <laughs> can, can pay my rent. Yeah. So you have a lot of people, especially at that time, um, a lot of people who included um, – a little bit of light surgery, a lot of herbal medicine, a few patent medicines they could get. Um, of course, a lot of magic, a lot of the sort of um, almost slightly hypno hypnotic stuff that a lot of physicians used to do before they became pushers for the drug industry, um, where you, you talk people down off, off, out of their state of panic and get them to relax and feel better. And so the, you can call them healers. You could also call them... You can also call them Mm, magicians. Mm. The term occultist was not invented yet. Mm -hmm. um, the term occultist has a complicated origin. Um, back in the Renaissance, when the, when, the, when, when the power of the church to suppress magic really faltered badly, and so you had people publishing books on magic for the first time in centuries, the way they talked about it was that there's, this, is, this is a philosophy, this is a hidden philosophy. This is the philosophy that was secret. This is the philosophy about hidden things. And in Latin, hidden or secret is occultus. 
um, it, we still use that in some ways. When astronomers talk about when, when like the moon goes across a star so you can't see the star, they say the, the moon occulted the star. Mm -hmm. um, go down to the doctor, you might get an occult blood test. This is not a test to find out if you've been sacrificing chickens in strange rituals. Yeah. <laughs> it's to determine if there's blood in your stool sample that, that can't, be se can't be seen, but it's there anyway. So yeah, so it was the hidden philosophy, the secret philosophy. And the, yeah. European languages are funny this way. They'll take an adjective and turn it into a noun. Originally, a submarine was a submarine boat. Yeah. Okay, it was a boat under the water. <clears throat> Originally, a pistol was a pistol gun, a gun from Pistoia, a town in Italy. We do this constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what happened. Occult philosophy became occult, or occultism, occultism uh, was, was the term I coined in France, and I think in the mid-19th century. And it picked up, because, picked up very well, because people liked that label. They said, okay, we need a broad category that, in, that isn't just limited to magic, but includes the whole range of the philosophy of the unseen, of the secret philosophy, the stuff that the Renaissance mages were talking about. And so it's become standard in English. But that didn't, that wasn't, that hadn't happened in colonial times. And there it was just, you know, what you do. Um, one of the other, okay, magic, we, we've talked about what magic is. Um, and mysticism is a little more complex. Here again, it depends on who you're talking to. But um, mystics generally seek experiences of, of spiritual realities. They may seek union with the divine. They certainly seek contact with the divine. And that's their focus, not doing things in the world, hmm. but, but uniting themselves to God or, you know, or the gods or fill in the blank, depending on your, on the religion in question. Mm -hmm. um, but your basic Christian mystic is crazy in love with God and wants to enter into the divine presence forever. And that's the center of their life. That's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so do you get mystics who are healers? Of course. Do you get mystics who are cultists? Yep. Do you get people who are all three and, and several other things behind, beside? Yes. Because human beings are complex creatures. Mm -hmm. We don't fall into simple categories that often. Yeah, for sure. So I've got a question about occult philosophy. In mm -hmm. um, a, a big word that has been popping up on all the podcasts and blogs over the last few years um, is uh, animism. People, mm -hmm. it's, it's become popular again. And <laughs> from my view, it seems as though traditional occult philosophy is very similar to the concept of animism. Um, but I was wondering, you know, what, what do you think about that? And uh, where, what actually are the sources for occult philosophy? Is it like Eliphas Levi? Is it theosophy? Like, where does it come from? Okay, let's start with animism. First of all, that term has been, like so many words, you know, again, it's a word, it's, uh, uh. it's been stretched and lopped and squeezed and fondled and has had several other things done to it, not suitable for a discussion of family podcast. Um, and so a lot of people use it in a very loose way these days. Um, they, the, there's a sense that everything is in some sense alive that everything is in, in some sense has a soul, has a spiritual dimension. And the fact that that has to have a special label, to my mind, shows me how crazy modern Western civilization is because most human beings throughout history and throughout the world have taken that for granted. They, 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 of course, that's the way the world is. Oh, yeah. And so the, we have to have a label for it. We have to say, well, that's animism. That's a strange belief that... Um, <laughs> Yeah, that 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 shows that frankly shows how clueless we are. Um, so, the 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 thing that the place where I tend to draw back a little bit from animism is that a lot of people say yes, all things have this have this life, they have soul, but human beings still tell everyone thing else what to do. <laughs> right. They may not say that explicitly, but watch the magic they do. It always amounts to human beings being you know um, being the one the boss. Okay. In traditional occult philosophy, uh -uh. <laughs> human beings are one category of intelligent um, incarnate being. Um, are we the smartest thing in the universe? Not by a long shot. Are we the most powerful things in the universe? Uh -uh. Um, I, I could go to, I could continue uh, through the thing. The, this notion of man, the conqueror of nature, you know, man, the measure of all things. It, it, come on. We're fooling ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, here we are, one species of um, balding hominid 
trotting around on one little lump of mud, spinning around um, a nondescript star in the bargain basement corner of, the, of one galaxy. We are not the, the, the masters of creation. And the sooner we get that through our heads, the happier we will all be. <laughs> so animism is great, but it needs to be combined with the rec with recognition there are other people out there too, not all of whom have bodies, not all of whom are, are equals or are lessers. Now, that's the viewpoint of occult philosophy. The viewpoint of occult philosophy is that the universe is flooded with life, flooded with consciousness, and crammed with beings of a vast number of types. Um, some of you know, some of whom are much greater than we are, some of whom are much lesser, some of whom are wise and good and worth listening to, some of whom um, are quite the opposite. It's a complex cosmos out there. Yeah. Now, in, term, in, in terms of the origins of this, well, how far back do you want to go? We can start this, we can start the story in Egypt. Okay. Where um, a lot of this, a lot of what we now consider as occultism was a normal part of religion. The, the ancient Egyptians do not have a word, ancient Egyptian, their language did not have a word for religion, but it did have a word for magic, heka. And the practice of heka was central to ancient Egyptian life. Everybody was doing magic all the time. The priests in the temples, they, what they would do is they'd do one week on in priestly service in the temples, and they had to go through all kinds of special purifications. And then they have three weeks off, and they were and basically where they provided magical services to the, to the community. Hmm. And so they, all the priests went through this simple rotation process. And, and so there was a lot of magic in Egypt. Okay, um, ancient Egyptian civilization rose and plateaued for a very long time and finally declined and fell, as civilizations do. Um, they were conquered by the Persians, they were conquered by the Greeks, they were conquered by the Romans. Um, somewhere in the middle of this whole process, a bunch of people from ancient Greece went to Egypt. And they were curious, they wanted to know more of this stuff. They learned a great deal of the old Egyptian temple stuff, and they took him back with them. Um, you may have heard of a guy named Pythagoras, um, he of the famous theorem. He founded what's probably the first occult school in the Western world in what's now southern Italy. Um, and he, he, you know, he, had, he had his students. He, had, um, he would teach them these various complex philosophical things and practices and so on. It, the same sort of thing you'd get in, in any occult school ever since. But there were a bunch of them. There were a lot of people and a lot of individual teachers. And taking this Egyptian material, reworking it within the idea, to fit the ideas of Greek philosophy, Greek logic, Greek mathematics. Greeks were really good at that. And so it was out of that um, toward the, in, in the first couple of centuries of, of, the, of the, the Christian era, you had this sort of draw together in the sort of broad magical system that ended up being associated with a philosophical school called Neoplatonism. Long story there. The short version is simply that that's where we got the deeper intellectual levels of that, of, of the magical tradition. You have this Neoplatonist philosophy. You have this awareness of other levels of being. You had the first drafts of modern occultism being put together by people like Iamblichus and um, Proclus, who were both of those were famous Neoplatonist philosophers. Okay, then we have <clears throat> Christianity. Then we have Islam. And both of those went through their periods of extreme intolerance. And Islam interestingly pulled out of that um, before Christianity did. I'm not sure exactly why, but it, that's what happened. And so you had a whole bunch of magical stuff coming out from, from basically underground um, and being discussed. And then as, as things lightened up in Europe and the Dark Ages finally became a little less dark, you had a lot of Arabic texts on magic being translated into Latin, which was the, the scholarly language of the day. And so all of a sudden, all over Europe, you had people pawing through this stuff going, wow, this is cool. And eventually that gave rise to the Renaissance. And this is something your, major, your, your standard historians do not like to talk about, that the Renaissance was largely a movement of magic. Um, there are several, there are, however, Francis Yates is a historian that covers this in depth. And yeah, so you have this explosion of cultural creativity. Uh, well, that kind of got a backlash. And we had, first of all, the, the Reformation, we had the wars of religion, then we had the rise of the scientific revolution of, of modern materialism. And so it got stuffed down on, into the... Um, into the underground again, stepped down to the cellar, but not quite as far as it had been. 
Um, okay, fast forward now to the middle of the 19th century when Eliphas Levy in France comes out. He's, you know, he had been uh, active in politics. He'd been active. He was a writer. He met a, a, a Polish guy, um, Ronski. Um, the guy who invented the caterpillar tread that that you see on bulldozers and tanks these days, by the way. Um, but Ronsky was up to his eyeballs in magical stuff that he learned through various things. And he became um, Levy's teacher, his guru, you might even say. And then Levy sits down and, and pulls all this together and writes a book, um, The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic. And it sets off a cultural explosion. People across Europe are going, wow. This is incredibly cool, and it's much more interesting than the, 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 either the boring religion or the boring materialism that are the other two options on. And so, and so from there on, it's been a going concern. You have the Theosophists. It's one, one occult movement, and they did a lot of interesting work, and as long as you don't mind um, a lot of Hebrew, a lot of, try that again, Hindu terminology in you know, Sanskrit, uh, you, you're fine. Um, there's just all this proliferation of schools, of orders, of teachers, of traditions, and it's been an ongoing thing ever since. So that's, kind of, that's the very, very, very short form. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. A, lot, a lot like the beginning of, of history. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Um, the thing is, we, we have every reason to believe that magic is as old as our species. Mm. Right. That about the time, we, about the time our, our distant ancestors first figured out how to knock chips off a lump of stone and make it sharp, we were also saying, hmm, I, I wonder if I get a bunch of you know, these, these leaves. They, they have this kind of feeling. I wonder if I get a bunch of them together and like, like carry them with me, if that feeling will sort of stick to me. Right. And it did. And here we are. So, you know, along with, you know, the, the human beings in, inventing stone tools and the human beings inventing fire, we should also always remember the human beings were busy inventing magic at the same time. Absolutely. So there's Throg the caveman, you know, coming over, or, you know, Thro Throgina the cavewoman, coming up with the, with the, the original spells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious, um, speaking of, like, industrial societies, like, what do you... What do you see um, in the future? Uh, this this year has been wild, a wild ride for a lot of people. This this, this, this year has been exceedingly wild. It's been a wild ride. Um, yeah, and so I'm just wondering what what you see in the near future. Maybe what you see in the in the twenty year near future. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, those of those of our listeners who are at all familiar with my work are not going to be shocked by what follows. Those of my listeners who have not encountered my work, um, fasten your seatbelts, okay? <laughs> it, the, the, the basic delusion, the myth of modern times, the religion at, which, at the altar of which people cringe and grovel is the belief in progress. The idea that uh, all of human existence is this grand upward march from the caves to the stars. And, you know, we, we, we're going to get this marvelous Star Trek future metastasizing across the galaxy or something. What a load of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Civilizations rise, they crest, they decline, and they fall. Yeah. That's as true of our civilization as it is of every other civilization in the past and every civilization in the future. They have a life cycle. We're actually much of the way through the life cycle of our society, our civilization. We've, we've had our period of, of really rapid expansion and growth, the period of, being, of, of rapid expansion of technology. Do you know, for example, that the, the peak in invention as measured by new patents was in the 1880s? Wow. It's been downhill ever since, <laughs> which makes sense when you realize that our cars, our planes, um, most of the technology that surrounds us except for computers were all in existence in, ba in basically recognizable forms by the First World War. Right. Yeah. And by the First World War, they already had punch cards, and so the, the first steps toward computers were being taken. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, what we're in, in the short run, um, here in the United States, we've got a rough road ahead. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a very, a very bitterly divided society, and it's divided along axes that most people don't like to talk about. I mean, we love to talk about race. We love to talk about gender. Nobody likes to talk about social class, but those are the big divides in this country. Um, when you remember that, um, say, 50 years ago, 50 years ago when I was a child, a family of four living on one working class income could afford a home, three square meals a day, a car, all the things they need to clothe and take care of themselves and even have a little left over for the occasional luxury. Mm -hmm. Now, a, working, a family of four on one working class income is living on the street. Mm 
Yes. That's a huge transformation. Nobody wants to talk about it. That is why we're going through the political turmoil that we are in right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's another, that's a topic we, for another time, it's not a topic for this blog, for this blog, mm-hmm. this podcast, but it's something that's shaping our lives. And that's going to work its way out one way or the other over the decade ahead. Um, we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. I don't think the people who have profited from the last 40 years are going to like the outcome, but we'll see. Okay, over the longer run, the United States has finished its cycle through being the sort of top dog in the world of the global hegemon, as they say in political science. Mm-hmm. Um, we are d- descending from that. We are not going to have troops all over the world much longer. Um, if we play it smart, we can have the kind of experience that Great Britain had, you know, where they gave up their empire and they're doing okay. Mm-hmm. If we're not smart, we could crash and burn in a big way. Right. Um, how smart are we going to be? That remains to be seen. Um, over the very long term, industrial civilization is going, to, is, is going to twilight out. Not overnight. Everyone loves their apocalypses. Oh, yes, yes, we've got to have an instant catastrophe, even more glorious than any previous apocalypse. Not a chance. It's, you know, there will be minor disasters. There will be difficulties. Things will sort of wind down. But, you know, 200, 300 years from now, people are going to be living, people in, in North America are going to be living in about the same way that they were living about 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. Because we'll have run through the fossil fuels, we'll have run, run through the easily accessible um, high-tech minerals and all these other things. We'll be getting by. Um, we'll be getting by with a lot smaller population, but that's the way that goes. Um, so yeah, and then you know, out of that, many, some centuries later, after the the, the typical dark age, um, new societies will rise, and they will be completely different from ours. They will not be like us at all any more than we are like the Roman Empire. Mm. Yeah. So in, <laughs> there, this idea, this idea of, of cycles, this idea that like the, like the year, like the lifespan, things have their cycle, they have their day. This is something that the practice of natural magic gets you used to because you learn that, a natural, for example, an amulet will work really well for a while and then it will fade out as the energy is worn out. And so everything has that, sort of, has that sort of ebb and flow, that sort of cyclical process. And getting used to that is a good way to have a more interesting life and, and, you know, and fewer frustrations. Yeah. So we're winding down our time here. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, yeah, let's take it back to natural magic. Um, it seems as though natural magic is something, a skill that a lot of people can develop to help them deal with oh, yeah. the coming times. Mm-hmm. Um, so your book, The Encyclopedia of Natural Magic, mm-hmm. it was, it's a really wonderful uh, resource you. for anybody who wants to practice magical herbalism mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. any kind of ma- natural magic. Uh, you, you no, one, th- one thing that yeah. one thing I would stress for our readers is that it's not just an encyclopedia. It was originally titled, in fact, it's Natural Magic. They changed the name um, mm-hmm. partway through for reasons of their own. But it's actually a textbook in natural magic. It covers the philosophy. It covers the materials. It covers what you do with them. So go on. Yeah. Well, so you put that out 15 years ago, right? I think when, was it longer than that? Maybe, maybe what I saw. Give, give me, I gotta have to, I gotta have to page through to the copy. It's been, yeah, it came out in two thousand, so it's been twenty, it's twenty years now. Wow. It's a long time. So, um, if you put out a new edition of it, uh, what would mm-hmm. you like to add to it? Um, and what are some other resources that people can get, like what other books or blogs or whatever? That okay. Yeah, people can. Yeah, the major thing that I would add to it since since after I. Um, wrote that book, I ended up having the opportunity to study traditional um, African-American hoodoo, which is one of our, one of our um, American traditions of magic. Hoodoo is, hoodoo is to magic what the blues is to music, basically. And it's got an immensely rich body of lore in terms of herbs, in terms of other, other natural products that it uses in various magic ways. If I were to do, an, do a new edition, that this book does include some hoodoo practice, practices and some hoodoo methods, but it could include much, much more. Mm. Um, there is also, I, I haven't really kept up on what the latest books are on the subject, but there's quite a bit of stuff available um, in terms of hoodoo practice. It's become much more popular um, among, among magical practitioners outside of the African-American community of late. And that's great. Um, let's see. That's, a, that's really the only thing that I can think of that I would add to it. I think, I think it, the, the book held up very well. Um, it, was, it, it was the compilation of work that I've been doing for well over a decade. And I drew very heavily on, on the old um, texts of verbalism and so on. I, I happened to be able to read Latin, so that helped a lot. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Uh-huh. And so, yeah. 
how so how do you do all that you do you've written you know dozens and dozens of books i've, I've, I've written i've written upwards of 70 books oh they're 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 two very they're two very simple rules the first and i can pass them on to our listeners right now the first one is get rid of your television yeah <laughs> seriously most people lose four hours a day you could you could be having a life during those four hours you could be doing any number of interesting things. Instead, you're sitting there staring at a little jerky pictures on a glass screen, glass screen while drool puddles in your lap. You do not have to live that way. Yeah. Um, we, I, I, will, I will tell one story about that. With, um, my, my, when my wife and I first moved in together, my, my now wife, we weren't married yet, um, her brother insisted that we had to have a television and gave us his old black and white set, hmm. even though we didn't want it. So we stuck it in the closet under the vacuum cleaner. And then um, some years later, I heard something was happening. The Soviet Union still existed in those days, and um, it looked as though there might be a war. So we tried to get out the television and plug it in and see if there's a news program that would tell us if we were all going to be vaporized. Um, the thing didn't work. Apparently, it's time under the vacuum cleaner to cause her to give up the ghost. So I asked permission and got it, took it out on the fire escape and dropped it two stories straight down into the dumpster. Nice. The flash and bang when the picture two imploded was more interesting than anything that had ever appeared on that screen. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So do this. Yeah. You know, if you want more time, if you want to have an interesting life, if you want to have the kind of life that everybody had before they had televisions, when they could get lots of stuff done, ditch your TV. Yeah. Get rid of it. Don't know half measures. There is a dumpster somewhere that wants that TV. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is um, that, well, as I mentioned, I have Asperger's syndrome. I'm not especially a social person. I, I mean, I, I have friends. I hang with people sometimes, but I like a lot of solitude. Right. And so um, when I have my solitude, a lot of what I do is right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't, I do not recommend that people go out and get Asperger's syndrome, if they, even if that were possible. But, <laughs> but I do recommend getting rid of your television. Okay. <laughs> Good advice. For them. Well, thank you very much, John Michael Greer, for being on our mm -hmm. podcast. It's been an well, honor. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah. And so people can find you. I mean, your books are all over. My book, my books are all over. You can go to the go to your your uh, full, local full service bookstore, and they can get they can get anything I've written. Um, if you must do online, well, go online. Um, in terms of my blogs, um, www.ecosophia.net, e c o s o p h i a dot net, or e or ecosophia at dreamwith.org are two places where I, I routinely post stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Thanks, Jamie. Thank Appreciate you very, it. very much. Thank you.